We're going to start about, I know we talked the other night about, um, you know, first of all, why we're here. And uh, we're investigating the homicide yes. that, uh, that Cassie um, Stoddard was, was, was murdered. You know what you need to do. You know exactly what happened and you know what you need to do. So, unfortunately, you're not going anywhere tonight. You're going to be placed into custody tonight. <clears throat> Everybody at school is going to know. A promise from you that there is no more more lies, right? No, this is it. This, this is. This is it. I know. I don't know why you even think I would kill my friend. Come on, Brian. She was not supposed to die. I, I, I know. You but, didn't mean how do you for feel that about Cassie? Happen. Tell us how you feel about Cassie dying. I'm. Uh, I am s extremely sad. Hey, look, it's Cassie. Hey, look. Hello, Cassie. <laughs> I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Hi. Okay, see ya. September 27th, 2006. We're skipping the fourth hour. We're not even a plan right now. Uh, I'm telling Cassie's family, but she had to number one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> We know there's lots of doors, and there, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors, so it's all locked. Now we just gotta wait. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm I stabbed her in the throat, and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I oh just killed God. Cassie. Oh, oh, fuck. That felt like it wasn't even real. The year was 2005 and Frank and Allison Contreras were excited for their move from the bustling San Francisco Bay Area to the more serene atmosphere of Pocatello, Idaho. The Contreras' new home was located on Whispering Cliffs Drive, it had four bedrooms, three bathrooms, and sat on two acres of land. In September of 2006, Frank and Allison Contreras made a plan for a weekend getaway to Wyoming. They needed someone to watch their house and pets while they were gone, and their niece, 16-year-old Cassie, had babysat for them on several occasions and would be the obvious choice for the job. Cassie Jo Stoddart was born on December 21, 1989 in Pocatello, Idaho. She had two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother. Frank and Allison thought highly of Cassie, as she was trustworthy, responsible, and they knew she wouldn't trash the house while they were gone. Cassie jumped at the opportunity to house sit as she loved spending time at her aunt and uncle's home. Plus, it was an easy way to make some extra money. At the time the story takes place, Cassie was a junior at Pocatello High School. Her and her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, had known each other since middle school, but the two had only been dating for about five months. After school on Friday, September 22, 2006, Cassie arrived at her aunt and uncle's home on Whispering Cliffs Drive. Cassie was planning on house sitting for the entire weekend. Since the house was in a desolate area, Cassie asked her aunt and uncle if Matt could keep her company in the evenings. They told her that would be fine, but to not invite anyone else over. Unfortunately, by Saturday morning, Cassie would be ruthlessly murdered in her family's home. At 6 p.m. that Friday, Matt arrived at the house. Unbeknownst to Cassie, Matt invited two other friends from school over to the home. The two teen boys were Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik. Brian and Tori were classmates of both Matt and Cassie's at Pocatello High School. While Cassie knew of them, they were more so acquaintances rather than close friends to her. In fact, Cassie was annoyed at Matt for inviting them over without asking her first. Brian and Tori arrived between 6.30 and 7 p.m. and Cassie gave the boys a tour of the house. While she was showing them the basement, Brian unlocked the door which led to the backyard without Cassie's knowledge. Once Cassie finished giving the tour, the four returned to the living room and began watching a movie. About halfway through the movie, Brian and Tori announced that they were bored and wanted to leave. They told Matt and Cassie that they were going to a movie theater to watch a film. By this point, they had been at the house for about two hours, but Tori and Brian never actually left the property. Instead, they went outside for about 10 minutes. Presumably, they went to Tori's car to put on their Halloween masks, grab their gloves, and their knives they brought along with them. They then went back into the house via the unlocked basement door and hid in a small room where the circuit breaker was located. They turned the power off in hopes it would lure Matt and Cassie into the basement. Matt and Cassie knew the circuit breaker was in the basement, but they were both too scared to go downstairs to check it. Instead, they sat on the couch and huddled together, hoping that the lights would come back on on their own. At the same time, one of the Contreras dogs began growling at the door which led to the basement stairs, which only added to Matt and Cassie's fear. It's around this time that Matt called his mother, asking if he could stay the night with Cassie. Matt's mom said no, but offered Cassie to spend the night at Matt's house. 
Matt's mom recalls Cassie saying, No, I have to let the animals out real early. I'm just going to stay here. Sherry, Matt's mom, picked him up between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. that evening. Matt told Cassie he would call her when he arrived home later on. They said their goodbyes, and this would be the last time that he would see Cassie alive. After Matt's departure, Tori and Brian, now wearing horror movie type masks and armed with knives, went upstairs. While upstairs, Brian slammed a door hoping to scare Cassie and drawing her towards the noise. When she didn't enter the room they were hiding in, they walked into the living room where Cassie was. Cassie stated, who is that? As she cautiously approached, the masked figure stabbed her. Cassie was stabbed 30 times, 9 to 12 of which had the potential to be fatal. Brian and Tori then drove to a rural area with the intention of hiding the evidence. They placed the weapons, clothing, and other evidence in a bag and set it on fire. Cassie's boyfriend, Matt, called her later that evening at 12.15 a.m., but there was no answer. Cassie is left to bleed out on her aunt and uncle's living room floor. The morning of Saturday, September 23rd, Matt repeatedly called Cassie approximately 15 times. Anna Stoddard, Cassie's mother, had also reached out to her multiple times throughout Saturday, calling and texting her, but Cassie never answered. On Sunday, September 24, 2006, Cassie's mom keeps attempting to contact her. About 1.15 that day, the Contreras family arrived back home from their trip to Wyoming. Cassie's aunt told investigators the doors were all open and unlocked, and there was broken glass at the foot of the stairs. Her husband, Frank, went inside and came back out screaming, Call 911. Somebody is dead on the floor. Court documents say Cassie's aunt saw Cassie's body on the floor in the living room. There was blood behind her head, and her left pinky was almost fully cut off. It was at this time she saw Anna's daughter and Cassie's stepdad, Victor Price, pulling up to the house. Frank met them outside and told them that Cassie had been murdered. Since Matt, Tori, and Brian were the last three people to see Cassie alive, they were all interviewed by police in their home shortly following the murder. Detectives went to Tori's home on September 24, 2006 to interview him regarding the murder of Cassie. Tori told detectives that he and Brian went to hang out with Cassie and Matt. After hanging for a bit, they realized there wouldn't be a party there like they had expected, so they left. He stated they went to see a movie, but couldn't recall any details from the movie they supposedly saw. Detectives then interviewed Brian at his home on September 25, 2006. Documents revealed that Brian started crying before telling police that he had visited Cassie and Matt, but had left once he and Tori realized there wouldn't be a party like they originally thought. He then stated they had gone to see the movie Pulse. When asked by detectives and his mother about the plot, Brian couldn't describe the scenario of the movie. Explore With Us, another YouTube channel, made an excellent and incredibly in-depth video about both Brian and Tori's interrogations and interviews. I'm featuring clips from that video on this video, but if you're interested in watching the more full-length version of the interviews, please go on ahead and go on over to his channel. I will link it in the description box of this video. Brian was interviewed again on September 26, 2006. This time it was at the Pocatello Police Station. His parents were not allowed in the room, and during this interview, the detectives told him they didn't believe Brian's story. He denied going back to the house where Cassie was staying and having any involvement in her death. Instead, Brian claims him and Tori were in the area breaking into cars and burglarizing them. We did go through cars. I mean, that's the truth. It's exactly what we did. Brian, she was not supposed to die. I, I, I had no You clue. didn't mean how did you for feel that about to Cassie? happen. Tell us how you feel about Cassie dying. I'm, uh, I'm s extremely sad. When Cassie died. Okay? I know exactly when. Okay. She died when you guys left, right after you guys left and Matt left. Okay. Okay. So now you're telling me you just happened to be back in the neighborhood burglarizing cars with gloves on, but you don't go in and kill Cassie. Then we start theorizing things. We know that Brian is not being truthful about the movie. We picked up on that in a second. Okay. But we had to go prove it, okay? The second thing is that we know that you're not being truthful about the car burglars. We're not buying the car burglars. That is the truth. Cassie is dead. She's not supposed to die, but she does. And you know what? I think you see it. I don't know if you're there. I don't know if you're on top of it. I don't know if you freak out and you do it. I don't know if Tori does it, but you know something? You're there. I can see it. I can see it in your eyes. I know by the evidence that we have that you're there. Okay? I was there before. I know that you guys come back. I know that you come back. I, either it's you or it's Tori. 
Well, I don't remember okay. who it was, but I, I, I did not go back to the house that night, I swear. I did not go back to the house. Okay. You're not being truthful with us about the car burglaries. Don't, let, don't even insult us. I'm not trying to insult you. We did help your cars. I mean, that's the truth. That's exactly what we did. Brian, she was not supposed to die. I, I, I know. You that, didn't mean for that How do you feel about that. Cassie? Tell us how you feel about Cassie dying. I'm, uh, I'm s extremely sad. We happened to find out that that you're in the area of her house. Not only you guys in the area of her house, but you guys are wearing gloves. In yeah, the area. I know what the Okay, so, and then, oh yeah, by the way, I mean, just so happens, you know, Cassie ends up dead, um, and she's been stabbed, okay? I promise from you that there is no more, more lines, right? No, this is it, this, this is, this is it. I did not, I don't know why you even think I would kill my friend. Come on. They could have had something. You get wrapped up in movies. You get wrapped up in movies. You get wrapped up in movies. You get wrapped up in all this culture. Yeah, you say something like that. Honestly, I mean, it just, I mean, we've got to wonder. I mean, we, I've got to get through those things. I mean, you guys are like heavy into this stuff. It's not like you haven't seen it before, like in movies. You're sitting I mean, there in disbelief wondering how the hell could they be thinking this? But well, then you I'm watch in the area. Stuff all the time. Oh, I've lied to them. I'm wearing fucking gloves. Hmm, you know? Dude, you gotta I see. Well, you, you gotta understand, understand what we're coming from. Guy. I understand what you're saying. Yes, I guess. Do you know? I mean, you guys are making this tough for us. Yeah. Because when we catch the person, and we are gonna catch them, Good. the people. Okay. Then you guys have muddied the waters. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it's not just uh huh. I mean, that's not good. Okay. okay. That's not a good thing at all. You need to get into a car with us, and you need to show us what houses you went to. Tori was then brought into the police station for a formal interview with his father and mother by his side. We're going to start about, I know we talked the other night about, um, you know, first of all, why we're here, and uh, we're investigating the homicide. Yes. That, uh, that Cassie um, Stoddard was, was, was murdered. Yes. And, um, and uh, because of the fact that you were, you know, one of the last three people you know, there, and you had knowledge of her and stuff like that. It's common course that we want to go and, and interview people and find out what you know. Well, what is your relationship with Cassie? Friends. So how often do you see her, maybe during a week? Uh, every day at school, but this would be my third time hanging out with her outside yeah. of school. Fair enough. Let's talk about Friday, and I think the date was the 22nd. What, what time did I leave from our house? Um, On Friday. It was after... I got back from taking Jamie to the game. It was about 6.30 or seven. Yeah, 6.30ish. About there. Okay, between 6.30 and 7. Yeah. You left your house. Yeah, and I went and picked up Probably Brian. Seven. Probably, yeah, between 6.30 and 7. Okay. And, um... You picked up Brian. You were driving your yeah. way. That red... Is it you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's your car. You get back and forth in. So you drove that to Brian's house. I picked him up, and then... About around what time do you think it was? Uh, I don't know, maybe seven, between seven and seven days. Okay. Brian is eventually broken down by detectives and takes them to the location of the murder weapons. Brian led investigators to Black Rock Canyon where he and Tori had disposed the evidence from the crime scene that connected them to the murders. They recovered close to two dozen items from the location which included a pair of black boots, gloves, four different kinds of knives, one of which had a serrated blade, several of the items were partially burned, one being a handwritten note. They were able to decipher a message about the possibility of killing Matt if he was still at the house. There was also Halloween-style masks, a Sony videotape, and a camcorder. Brian was arrested shortly after showing the detectives the location of the murder weapons and other evidence. He was then interviewed again and continued to try to maintain his innocence. Documents revealed that he changed his story once a detective asked him whether he stabbed Cassie in order to keep Tori from turning on him. Brian nodded yes and claimed he stabbed Cassie four times, but he didn't want to. He admitted to stabbing Cassie in the leg and chest area. But think, I want you to think back, okay? Some of the stabs are real deep. You know, they're, they're right. forceful. Those are not you, okay? I know that. And then some are real light. Yeah. They said, and they said that some of them are just little pecks. And you know what? I'm thinking... You know, you're caught up in a situation. It, this is Tori. 
is, is the fact that he's doing this and scaring you, are you scared that if you don't do this or something like that? Are you trying to medical you? I mean, is that possible? I think you're stabbing her to kill her. I don't think you would ever in a million years, Brian, do that, okay? But do you get caught up in the moment and you're just doing it to show him so you don't get turned on? Does that happen? Be honest with us, okay? Is that what happens? Do you just barely get it just to try to get the hell out of there? Is that what happens? Okay. How many times do you think? I mean, you just kind of want to. Okay. You didn't want to. We know that. We know you didn't want to. I don't know what for it. You both are ready. Okay. You're in leg. Okay. Where else? Well, then you can keep on to the Put the way in. And you said you threw the knife down? Yeah, I dropped the knife. Where'd you drop the knife? Oh, they followed the stairs. And then you pick it back up? No, he picks it up. You know, are, are you, you're being square about towards statue too? Yes. Okay, so that's, you're solid about that. Yes. Okay, so so he's not he's not the one standing watching. Okay? Is that good? Yes. We're good. Okay. okay. I just want to know that. We, we can work through anything that we got going on. Is there any way that you can remember the chain of events that takes place? Is he stabbing her maliciously and trying to hurt her? What what makes you finally have to stab her? She, she comes over and says, makes make sure she's dead. You, you need to stab her. You, you need to stab her. I, I, I don't know what you think, and I say, I, I can't do it, and she needs to start, just do it quick. And what do you do? She's about to leave the one leg, and he says, it's not going to work, she has to die. Okay, so, why is he so close? Which is probably, but, you, but, I mean, you said before, she's probably already dead anyway. So, what you're doing, you're not killing her, he's going to kill her. That's, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's kind of saying that had Corey was arrested following a second interview after discovering his DNA on the mask worn the night of the murder. In response, Tori did his best to avoid any culpability for the crime by claiming Brian was the planner and executor. We got the evidence at this point to prove that. We, we, found also, the we also have some overwhelming evidence, uh, trace evidence, that type of stuff that's going to prove that they did it as well. It's not just hearsay, it's not just somebody saying it. You know what you need to do. You know exactly what happened and you know what you need to do. So, unfortunately, you're not going anywhere tonight. You're gonna to be placed into custody tonight, okay? Um, I'm gonna, sorry that's the way it goes. You're gonna be charged with first degree murder. Okay. okay, but like I said before, before you say anything, I, I encourage you, if you want to talk to attorney, you should do that. They want we know the cooperate. details, we've got the knife that you used, we've got the masks that you used, we've got the videotape, We've got, there's a tape up in there that you buried, okay? Try to catch on fire. Oh, that's, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I don't need to tell you that. This is right, Tori, and what they're saying is true. So? It sounds like you need a lawyer. If Brian already confessed, why wasn't he placed in custody? He's in custody. He wasn't this afternoon. He's in custody. Trust me. I don't know how. Two people in custody right now. You and Brian. That's been cleared today. Cleared by polygraph, cleared by all evidence. But we know what happened. Don't don't try to play don't try to play geez, I can it's continue not to lie. Show up on the line. news and everybody at school is gonna know. Okay. If we ask 
And it's okay. They just need to search you real quick to make sure. Torrin, stand up, put your hands on the wall. Do I have anything that's going to stick or float me in these knives, needles, or anything? Put your hands on the wall. Okay. As investigators would soon find out from examining the camera footage, Brian and Tori considered themselves budding filmmakers, mainly interested in making documentary-style films. They were the test subjects in their own movies, going around documenting their everyday lives, and they had even previously filmed casting in their high school hallways prior to the murder. Supposed to be here at 7:30, and it's 8:19. He's an hour late. You, you don't even care, do you? <laughs> okay. September 22nd to 26. We're skipping the fourth hour. We're not even a plan right now. I'm telling Cassie's family, but GI Bill number one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect, so she's gonna die. <laughs> they were very vocal about the motive behind the murder being fame and the film Scream, hence why they wore scary masks and brought along various knives. They wanted to achieve notoriety and become status symbols in the homicide world. The other items recovered at Black Rock Canyon were taken to the lab for forensic analysis. And the partially burned black gloves were soaked with blood and DNA testing confirmed that the blood belonged to Cassie. Her blood was also present on a black-handled serrated knife Cassie's autopsy report revealed that she had been stabbed in her chest, neck, back, and abdomen. She had defensive wounds on her hands and arms, and on top of Brian's confession, it was what the boys talked about in the seized videotapes that really solidified their guilty verdict. The following comes from a clip recorded on September 21st, 2006 at 8.36 p.m. Tori is driving and Brian is in the passenger seat filming, detailing plans for the following day. There should be no odds against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing. But, you know, hell, watching. hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. The next day, the two film the entrances to the Contreras family property and declare they are waiting for Matt to leave before making their move. I was 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all locked. Now we just gotta wait. At 11.31 p.m., Tori and Brian are back in the car. Tori is driving and Brian is filming as he exclaims, I just killed Cassie. We just left her house and this is not a joke. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just God. killed Cassie. Oh, oh fuck. That felt like it wasn't real. I mean, it went by so Shut fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. On August 21st, 2007, both boys were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 30 years for conspiracy to commit murder. Andrew Stoddard, Cassie's brother, recently spoke to the Idaho State Journal in 2016, exactly 10 years after his sister's murder. As to whether he could ever forgive his sister's killers, he said that he couldn't. Every time a new court date comes up related to another appeal, his family's wounds are reopened. They just want to move forward with their lives without reliving the same traumatic events of that evening. Cassie Jo Stoddart was just 16 years old at the time of her brutal murder. 